gun. You can't fight in here. This is the war room. Shit filters full. Really? Yeah. I always go backwards when I'm backing up. What are you under? Yeah, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living boy. You failed to maintain your weapon, son. It's liberty! It, it's her! Whiskey, quick. Master, we are here. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Why is mad? Something is going to happen. What's going to happen? Something wonderful. You can call it the art of fighting without fighting. We started a game we never got to finish. I was just fooling about. I wasn't. Why don't you make like a tree and get the fuck out of here? Give me liberty or give me death! <laughs> Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast, a podcast where both you and I get to talk with, listen to, and ask questions of some of the most interesting people in the world. We only have one disclaimer. If you are offended by the truth, please go away. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Ernest Emerson, and uh, we've got uh, a guest on today that uh, his name is Chris Sinog, and uh, he is a shooting instructor. He's a former Navy SEAL, uh, a very interesting guy, uh, very uh, effective in his uh, chosen field. And uh, I'm not going to say too much more about him. I'm going to let him kind of uh, take control of the ball. But uh, before we get to him, uh, I'm going to read you something uh, that we've published that is apropos for what we're talking about, because after all, uh, what we're talking about is not hunting uh, skills uh, as much as self-defense skills with a firearm. So uh, I'm going to start off with legal advice on deadly force. Now, bear in mind, from a non-lawyer, so take it for what it's worth. So, what do you do if you're caught up in a deadly force scenario? Let me state again, I am not a lawyer, but I have been on the witness stand for the Los Angeles Prosecuting Attorney's Office several times. And uh, the first thing I want to tell you is this, hold up your right hand and say aloud right now, I will not lie. Now repeat it, I will not lie. If you do not want to go to prison for something you needed to do, do not exaggerate, do not stretch the truth, and do not lie, even once. Leave that to your attorney. No offense. The aftermath of a violent act, a deadly act, is like a play. There are villains, there are heroes, and there are extras on the set. In fact, you may actually really be on film. You never know. Play your part well and you'll get the Oscar. Play it badly and you'll get free room and board for life. So let's start a sequence and go through it step by step because it's easier to relate to. We're going to use a violent armed robbery as our subject. You are alone on the street walking home from Monday night football with your buddies. You have a legal license to carry a gun. And by the way, you better be able to prove you have had proper training and your license better be 100% current and legal at all times. As you are walking along the sidewalk to your car, about a block away, you look up and you see some road crews working under construction lights. When suddenly, out of nowhere, something hits you in the side of the head. There's an explosion of white light and you stagger. Your knees buckle momentarily as you turn and you can barely hear, Give me your effing money. All you see in front of you is a silhouette and the glint of a gun. I said, give me your effing money and your wallet. Hurry up, mother effer, or I'll blow your effing head off. You reach for your wallet and you fumble it as you hand it over and it falls to the ground. Stupid mother effer. And he fires off around at you. It strikes the car beside you as you recoil and then reach for your weapon. Boom, boom. And the silhouette falls to the ground silent. His gun clatters across the ground into the bushes. So here we go. 
If you are safe, do not flee the scene. If you have a cell phone, call 911 to report the incident. Call it in immediately. Do not wait. All you need to say is there's been a shooting and give the location if you can. The construction crew down the street has already called it in, but you better call it in too. You don't want to be on record calling it in 45 minutes later. Stay put. Do not tamper with the scene or the evidence. Do not move the weapon closer to the body. Forget everything you've ever heard from all the bullshit advisors you've ever heard. For example, putting the gun in his hand, hitting yourself to show he attacked you, yelling out, don't kill me, dragging someone back into your house. Believe me when I tell you, rearranging any evidence at all is not the thing to do. You hear the police sirens getting closer. Put your gun down on the ground. Put yourself in plain view. Do not be moving around when the unit rolls up. Don't run toward the police officers as they arrive. And for God's sake, have your hands in plain view. Let them come to you. Follow their commands. Remember they know nothing about what just happened except that there was a shooting. For all they know, you may be the bad guy. And you don't want to get shot, too. Now comes a very important part. You will be handcuffed. You may be arrested. If you are arrested, be assured that you will be bonded out after a few hours. So don't panic. It is just the way things work until it gets sorted out. This is one of the most important things to keep in mind. From the moment that the police arrive on the scene... Consider that anything and everything you say will have a direct effect on the outcome of the situation facing you. You are being interviewed or questioned from the moment they arrived. If you are arrested, you will hear the following. Miranda writes, Number one, you have the right to remain silent. Number two, anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. Number three, you have the right to an attorney now and during further questioning. Number four, if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you free of charge. Now, everyone always wants to tell the story of what just happened. It was a huge, traumatic event, and you want to tell someone about it. It's just human nature. Don't do it. You have to be in control of your emotions. You must request an attorney and have him present before you answer any questions. It's okay to say, Officer, I need an attorney before I answer any questions. Remember the Miranda rights. You are being placed under arrest and anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be appointed for you. You are not presumed guilty by requesting an attorney. And look carefully at Miranda. It says, will be used against you, not for you, in a court of law. A very famous attorney once told me, for God's sake, keep your mouth shut. You can think about it like this. Every word that comes out of your mouth is a $1,000 bill floating away because that's what it's going to cost you for me to undo every one of those words. From this point forward, it's not going to be an easy journey. There will be a criminal investigation. The DA may or may not file a case against you. There may also be a follow-up civil case by the bad guy's family. You can count on that. The whole mess may take years to get through. But in the worst of times to follow, know that if you were justified and you kept your wits about you, you will prevail and justice will be served. What happens after the incident will be a roller coaster ride of elation and despair. But you still have to maintain the spirit of a warrior to see you through. That spirit will never let you down. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the use of deadly force here uh, this morning and, uh, you know, some of the things that you have to be aware of uh, if you're ever uh, faced with an encounter where you have to use a firearm or or anything else uh, that may uh, 
you know, take the life of another person or not necessarily even take their life. But uh, if you had to use a weapon or something to defend yourself, uh, sometimes the police and or the jury jury and or the DA might uh, say that you use deadly force. Uh, and if you were a trained combatant, so to speak, uh, let's say a pro- professional boxer and you got into a, a, a fight with someone, they may even say that, that uh, because of your skills, uh, you employ deadly force. So, you know, just be aware of that, you know, it, it, we're all ready to say that you know we're going to defend ourselves and all that and and we need to be because we have to have that bias for uh, self-protection but at the same time uh, there's going to be some things you're going to have to deal with afterwards now that brings us right up uh, to uh, today's guest uh, Mr. Chris uh, Sinog am I pronouncing that right Chris? You are my friend you are many people get it wrong but you nailed it it's a tough one okay cool and uh I want to introduce uh, also Danny Treflick to uh, uh, Chris today. Hi, Chris. And What's up, Danny? He'll be on. So we're going to ask you a bunch of questions, Chris, and, and let you uh, roll with, with what you're doing. Uh, so all I can say is, right now to start with, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Uh, Chris is a retired uh, Navy SEAL. And he runs a very successful shooting program and is an author and a speaker and a guest in a, on a whole bunch of uh, different venues. So, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, can you take us through just a little bit of your, your background that you uh, would like to let us know who you are and uh, what you do and what you did? Well, Mr. Emerson, let me tell you something about our history together. I don't know if I ever told you this, <laughs> but... Your knife is the only knife I have ever cut myself with. <laughs> uh, I'm glad not we're on Zoom, around. not not in the same room. <laughs> no, it came, it came, it didn't even touch my skin. It's it was so sharp. It was it was probably like a quarter inch away, and I cut myself. So <laughs> it's those magic knives will do it every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I used to back in the day. I used to. Um, stitch up a bunch of uh, my my seal brothers when we first got the uh, spider coats, yep. and, and the, the flipping them open thing. Well, we got the, they got the knives, and uh, they weren't really trained on how to flip it open like that. So they, I sewed up probably like ten guys' feet. Uh, for, <laughs> Jeez. They got it open, but they didn't hold it in their hand. So. <laughs> Well, that's the thing about knives. You've got to always be careful. I guess it's just like a gun. You, you have to know where that edge is, just like you have to know where that barrel's pointing. So. Yeah, you got to know who made it. Did they make it uh, sharp enough to cut from uh, it doesn't even touch your skin? All right, so I'll tell you, um, you asked about kind of my history and stuff. So I grew up in Wisconsin, and uh, your basic uh, middle, upper middle class family. Uh, I was a terrible student. Uh, I was probably not the best son to have around. I uh, got in a lot of trouble. Only went to school when the judge made me go back to school. That kind of thing. Ended up uh, dropping out of school because I was no longer living at home. Had to work full time. And somehow I ended up like in Ohio. <laughs> with a girl that I met in Daytona Beach on spring break. And um, anyways, look, very long a uh, crazy story about how I got arrested for grand theft auto and got thrown in jail and ended up with no place to live, no car, no money, no nothing. And I met a Navy recruiter who said, Hey, I will give you some food and a place to sleep. What do you think about that? And I was like, <laughs> Hey, look at me. I'm all patriotic. Let's do it. So I uh, ended up joining the Navy. I had no idea what a Navy SEAL was at the time. Never heard of a Navy SEAL. And my company commander in boot camp, for some reason, we like hit it off. Like when he first saw me, uh, literally the first day, everyone's lined up and he he like, he, he yells at me and tells me to get in his office. So I go run in his office, got this big window and I can see he's uh, mashing the rest of the group, which is make a sailor hurt. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he's exercising him and then he comes in like two hours later and he's like hey what's up and i'm like um nothing sir he's like oh you can relax you can relax i can tell you you're you're not like the rest of these guys 
And uh, so he ended up being a diver, like a deep sea diver. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you, because I was going to be a, a medic, a corpsman. So he's like, you should go to dive school and be a dive medic. He said, you'd be really good at it. You know, I can tell you just kind of, you'd fit in. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I did. So easily influenceable at this uh, point in my life, apparently. Uh, I went to dive med tech school in Panama City, Florida. And during my time there, it was a long school, like six months long or something. They had a base gym. So I would go into the gym and I'd work out with this group. And there was a small group of SEALs that were stationed on on that little base where the dive school is. So I got to know the, these SEALs and I ended up graduating the top of my class in dive school. So I got to pick wherever I wanted to go. Basically, anything that was open, I would get to choose where to go. So they had an opening at this little dive locker in Panama City, Florida. So I ended up... Uh, going there and working there for two years. And then they recommended that I stay uh, supporting the SEALs as a diver. And I went down to uh, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. So I was down, there's a unit down there and I would go out uh, when uh, platoons and stuff would come down to train. I would go out and be their medic and do medical support and dive support and stuff when they work with submarines and all kinds of fun stuff. But then it got time for the end of my tour there, and they were basically either going to send me uh, to a ship, which I had been in the Navy over four years now, and I'd never been on a ship, so that didn't sound good. And Or they were going to send me to be an instructor at dive school. And at the time, I had no um, you know, desire to, to be an instructor. It just didn't sound good to me at all, so mm -hmm. I was like, well, what else could I do? So I had been working with SEALs for four years now, supporting them, and, I, you know, kind of, I liked them. I liked working with that type of person. So the master chief that I was working for in the medical department down there was like, he's like best friends with the detailer. So the detailer is the guy that tells you where you're going to go next. Um, so he called him up and said, hey, give this guy orders to BUDS, to SEAL training, uh, the, the next available class. And so within two hours, uh, I had, they sent like a message out. Um, so I had orders to buds. So it took me two hours to get orders to buds, yep. which is always an interesting story because later on in my career, I was, uh, a seal motivator. So we, we used to go around and help recruiters, uh, try to get people to become seals or get them interested in it. And so people always want to hear your story of how hard it was for you to get into SEAL training because <laughs> most people, it's like at least a two-year yeah. journey to try to get in. And mine was two hours. Um, so anyway, so I, so I went on, went to BUDS, and that was interesting because I had known so, so many SEALs were my friends mm -hmm. uh, when I went to um went to buds so that was strike one against me strike two against me is that i was a diver so if you if you're a diver and you go to uh, seal training uh during dive phase you will automatically fail like <laughs> so twice they like threw me out of the the water like up physically on onto the pool deck and like they're yelling he's the scaredest person i've ever seen underwater i've never seen any he was crying. He didn't know what to do. And, you know, all you, all you can say is who you are. And then you go sit in the corner. So you get three chances to, to pass mm -hmm. the, the, um, this par part of training. So uh, the third time, uh, a master chief who I knew, he was one of my friends, but he was also an instructor there. Uh, he's like, all right, Chris, uh, so this is your last chance, you know, if, if you don't. You don't pass it. You're going home. So I'm going to let you go down to the bottom and swim around. I'll let you do a couple laps to get comfortable. And then we'll start the hit. So, so they do three things where they swim down once and they might rip off your mask. And you got to put your mask back on and say you're okay. And then the second time, they'll rip off your mask. They'll undo your, um, your tank straps and they'll roll you over. 
and you got to, you know, put your mask back on, mm-hmm. put your tanks back on, thumbs up, you're over, uh, you're good. And then the third one is when it's like they're going to make it so bad that you can't fix it and you have to you have to say you're okay and then come to the surface. Like they'll tie your hoses in knots, you know, so you yep. can get out. So I'm, he's like, okay, so you understand? I'm like, yeah. So he's like, okay, so I so I go down, I go underwater, and there's there's this um, decline that you have to go down to to the deep part. So uh, we were like in the middle part, so I just start going down the decline, and this master chief smashes my face against the bottom of the pool, rips my mask off, and he he ripped my hoses off so hard that um, my mouthpiece fell off of the hose. Yeah. So, and then he swam away. So I was sitting there with this stream of air being blown out of this tube and a floating mouthpiece uh, in, the, in the water. Somewhere. So, I, yeah, well, I grabbed it and I put it against the, <laughs> like I held it against the tube and then I held, held the other end and my mouth and holding these pieces in my mouth and I took a breath and like held my thumb up with my one hand and uh, <laughs> he laughs and brings me the service. He's like, all right, you're good. <laughs> so there's a lot of, you know, interesting stuff like that. And then just knowing the seals going through training, we would be out on the grinder and probably it was like once a week I'd hear Synog, get up here. And I'd, I'd look up and it was somebody I knew and I was like, oh, oh, yeah. He's got this huge grin on his face. Hey, what's up, buddy? Yeah. Um, you know, and then there's his instructor going, so, uh, so yeah, Chief Davis said uh, that you said, uh, you know, you could whoop all our asses. <laughs> and, uh, that this training was the easiest thing you've ever heard of. Is that right? <laughs> and all you can say is who yeah. yeah. Like, you cannot argue. You can't say, oh, no, I didn't say that. So you're like, hoo yeah! Oh, you said that, hoo yeah! Um, so then, you know, it'd be stuff <laughs> like, like, okay, come, you know, go down, hit the surf, come back with uh, with at least a cup full of water in your mouth, which is, you know, like impossible. But you go mm-hmm. and try try to do it, you know. So, anyways, uh, uh, I made it through. My, you know, my my training was harder than anybody else's. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, listen, Chris, uh, you mentioned you were down in Panama City. Uh, I was down there uh, doing a class uh, at an SDV, uh, SDV1, I think it was. Um, what years were you down there? Uh, I think I was down there in about, it must have been about 2003 or something like that. Do you remember? Uh, I had been long gone by then. Okay. Yeah, I was, this, this was uh, 89 to uh, uh, 90. Two. Well, what, what, when, when did you join the service? 89. 89. Okay. So, uh, and, and when did you actually graduate, uh, you know, get your Trident pinned on you? What year was that? Uh, well, I graduated, um, from buds in, uh, 2000, uh, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Sorry for the hard <laughs> questions, dude. <laughs> No, 1995. <laughs> I started with class 198. I got rolled back out. after hell week because I had like flesh eating bacteria in both my elbows and both my knees. But luckily, I got rolled forward, not backwards. Yeah. So I graduated with 199. Um, yeah. So how, how do you get that? At the time you didn't get your trident after um, training like they do now. Yeah. Um, which when they made that change, nobody liked it, but it actually makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. that the way they do it now. But yeah, so I had to go to, so I graduated, then I went to, um, jump school. Then I went to, uh, m- medical training, 18 Delta medical training down in uh, Fort Sam Houston. Um, and luckily I graduated top of my class. Uh, there also, so I got to pick which team I wanted to go to. So mm-hmm. I picked two uh, because I I'm of Norwegian heritage, so I wanted to go cold places, yeah, which I did plenty of. And that was always interesting because uh, in when you go through training, the instructors are always saying, you know, you'll 
you're going to be 10 times colder than you are right now. And when you're going through training, you're like, that is like impossible. There's no way it could possibly be colder than I am right now because I'm about to die. In fact, the guy right next to me is going into convulsions, because, <laughs> which actually happened. Um, and then now I carried him out of the surf and the instructors didn't care or seem to care about the guy in convulsions. They were asking me if I was quitting. <laughs> oh, no way. Are you two guys quitting? You're quitting. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not quitting. They're like, get back in the water. I'm like, okay, here's this guy. <laughs> uh, but then I, I remember we were doing, it was actually a training exercise. It was in Virginia and it was so cold. Uh, there was like this freezing rain and we were, we were going, going up this riverway and the, the ice in would freeze. First it was freezing our goggles. So we couldn't wear our goggles. Mm -hmm. So we had to take our goggles off so we could see. And then the, the rain would hit your eyes and it'd freeze so fast because of this, this headwind we were going into. You had to mm -hmm. rub your eyes to be able to see. And then the next thing that was happening was that the um, fuel line for our little boats would keep freezing. So we'd make, up, make it up the, uh, you know, a little bit up the, this river against this headwind and then the, the gas line freezes and then we have to take it apart, warm it up, put it back together, get the engine started. And now we're like back where we started. So we're like going back and forth up this thing. And um, actually, the, the, we were supposed to get extracted out of there by uh, some bigger boats, uh, some of our friends who drive bigger boats. And they ended up, we had been out for two weeks doing this training. Mm -hmm. um, and these guys came out like, two hours before that to pick us up at the end of the training. And they went back because they had a cold injury. <laughs> and it was then like when I heard that over the radio, it was like it, it back in my mind, I'm seeing my instructors telling me you're going to be 10 times colder. And I'm and like, you're... what? They were not lying. <laughs> hey, listen, yes, uh, yes, uh, I am 10 times colder. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm from Northern Wisconsin. And uh, I've been pretty dang cold. And, uh, but I'll guarantee you, even at the coldest that I've ever been, I've never had uh, my eyeballs uh, freezing over. <laughs> in the front. And I mean, I've been in 40, 50 below zero. <laughs> I didn't know we were fellow cheeseheads. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm, I'm from way up north, uh, just south of, uh, I, I, kind of in the Hayward area up there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I had uh, one of my uh, grandmothers was in uh, Chippewa Falls. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Chippewa, so, isn't that the home of either Lining Kugels or? Lining Kugels. Yeah. So when I was a kid, like I, I, I have two boys and I always tell them this story, but we would always go and have, uh, when we stayed with grandma, we'd get beer and pizza. Mm -hmm. So I always remember having this big, thing of beer but i learned years later it was a shot glass that we would get full of beer <laughs> but with line of kugels they had uh tours oh yes three tours and you'd get this little wooden nickel at the start of the tour and at the end you could ask for a sample of beer and we were probably like eight and ten years old and we would go through and do this tour multiple times a day oh and yeah like back then like nobody cared they're like there you go. What, yeah. what kind you want? You know, it's funny because uh, Line and Kugels is one of my favorite beers, and I still. Uh, that's one of the things uh, when we go. We go back every single summer and stay for two or three weeks. We got a place on a lake up there, and uh, one of the things that I, I look forward to uh, almost most of all is being able to buy all kinds of different uh, Line and Kugels because they only have out here in California. I think they only have the sh summer shanty or something like that, which in my mind isn't really what Line and Kugels is all about, but. Uh, there's a lot of good beer back there. Uh, you know, I, I had a similar thing. I went to school in La Crosse, and uh, La Crosse was the old style uh, G. Heilman uh, Brewing Company. And uh, every Friday night, we used to go <laughs> go on the brewery tour. And I'll tell you what, by the time we walked out uh, at the end of the tour, we were we were pretty hammered. <laughs> yeah, back then you could get like a like a case of bottle of beer bottles of beer for like 
three bucks or something, and then you could still turn the bottles back in for a deposit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could. And, uh, I, and, miss I, those I, days. and I don't know how when I was that young that I was buying cases of beer, but <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, we had a friend, <laughs> and uh, his dad. You know, these were, you know, the. I don't know if I should tell this or not, but um, I guess my kids will listen to this. But they're they're old enough now to hear this. But uh, again, every when this was when I was in in high school, I was probably sixteen years old. Uh, we'd go over to my friend's house, and uh, we'd be sitting on the couch, and there'd be like twelve other people sitting on the couch, couches and chairs in the room, and I'll just call him Mr. Johnson, and Mr. Johnson would take our orders, and then he would head over to the. Uh, uh, liquor store and then he'd come back and it would be like six pack of old style eighteen dollars and we'd be like okay <laughs> everybody's pulling their money together and i'm like that guy had a pretty good side business going on there his profit yeah. margin was pretty pretty high <laughs> yeah yeah i like that you said that like your, your kids are going to be listening to this like that's one thing uh i've been doing stuff online and you know i've got a youtube channel with 70,000 people now and wow um i have an app that just came out so so like there's um you know there's a lot of stuff i have online i've done major news interviews you know oh, yeah. and, um fox news and so all this stuff online but i always everything i do i always think that my kids are going to watch it oh yeah I want I want them, uh, you know, to watch it and and be proud of me and, um, you know, like actually learn something. Like I, I just see people do stuff online, like, and it makes you wonder, like, like do you have kids? Like, would would you want your kids uh, talking like you're talking or acting like you know? Yeah. Because um, this this stuff's online and everybody sees it. So, well, and I'm not like a goody two shoes, you know. Like one thing, like I don't, I just have never cursed very much. Like I never had the the sailor's mouth. It mm-hmm. doesn't bother me like at all. Like obviously, it couldn't being a Navy SEAL. <laughs> you know, like hey, excuse me, uh, watch your language. Did you watch your language? <laughs> F you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I will like, but like when I do it, like I feel it's it's like the icing on the on the cake, you know. It's not like the the base layer. Yeah, but I think like my kids. So I, I have two boys; they're uh, twelve and fourteen. But um, mm-hmm. they'll tell you the one time they heard heard me swear. Oh yeah, yeah. Like they both remember it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you. You know, someone once told me there's a difference between uh, uh, cursing and profanity. Uh, and sometimes people use you can use a uh, a curse word for effect if if that's what it takes to get get through. Uh, mm-hmm. I slip once in a while, but I try and keep it uh, you know above board because I'm exactly in the same boat as you. Uh, everything that I do, uh, I want my kids to be proud of. Ex- exactly the same uh, mentality. Uh, that y- you are the biggest influence outside of your your wife uh, to your children. <laughs> And uh, I am, and my wife, same thing. So our examples are the way that our kids are going to be. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, they just don't think ahead a little bit about that stuff. And, and, and uh, you know, every, everything I do is, is designed to, uh, to, I guess, uphold that uh, tradition. I, I know how my folks were. They were... I think I've mentioned this before a couple of times, Danny. Uh, I never saw my mom and dad fight, and uh, that's a rare, rare thing. And uh, so, you know, I want to be that kind of guy. I, I'm not saying my wife and I don't fight. We have some, some, uh, some tussles once in a while, and uh, but uh, we, we always make up. And uh, I think that's important too that the kids see that. So I'm with you, man. We, yep. we are who we, uh, who we appear to be on the on the internet anymore too. Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, you were uh, in the SEAL teams, and I know that you uh, – uh, w- when did you actually muster out? I uh, retired in 2009. And, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. my, my last year, I actually um, – so basically what happened, I, so I went on my – it was my last deployment, um, and I 
went to, uh, I was in Sudan Mm -hmm. uh, and I came back from that. And my oldest son, who was four years old at the time, he wouldn't eat. And just like, like he literally was like not eating for like two weeks and everybody's trying to get him to eat. Um, and then one day he came and told me, he said, you know, I'm like, dude, why aren't you eating? I know you got to grow up and be strong. And he said, dad, if I eat, I'll grow up. If I grow up, I'll become a daddy. If I become a daddy, I'll have to leave my family. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So when I heard, wow. heard I was, I was literally the next day going in to sign uh, a reenlistment for five years. I was going to get a $250,000 bonus. Yeah. Uh, instead, I said, I'm not signing that. I'm going to uh, submit my retirement papers because I was a year out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I spent the last year basically getting my body rebuilt. I had six major surgeries and like seven smaller surgeries. So I was uh, just going from surgery to rehab for a year. Luckily, the guy that I was working for at the time, a um, good friend of mine, uh, I saved his life. And so it's, it started off. So I'm working for him. So he's like, okay, you know, you gotta, you know, come in each morning and then, you know, we'll let you go to therapy. And then that turned into, Hey, call in every morning just so I know you're okay. Mm -hmm. And it was about that time when texting started coming out as a thing. So by the end it was like, Hey, just text me if anything happens, you know? So I pretty much got a a full year off to rebuild my body. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up with a hundred percent, um, disability, uh, in the end, just cause like multitude, I mean, yeah. a year of surgeries after, after, um, doing what I did. And, uh, Sorry about that. That's me. Yeah. And I don't want people to think that it's, uh, I, I had it harder than anybody else. I just, it's just my body <laughs> didn't take it as like, there's people that have done, much harder stuff than I I done, and they you know come out of it unscathed. So, um, well, you know what? Sometimes it's just a matter of inches, or even less. That you just happen to be in a situation that uh, you know five guys can do something, and you you twist or turn one degree, and uh, boom, it hits you. I wanted to ask you, uh, just out of curiosity, were they back uh, injuries? Because that seems to be a common common thing amongst you, amongst you guys. Yeah, so so the back in injuries is kind of the the weird one because it's the thing that cause, causes me the most pain, um, but I I don't have any disability for it. They ended up doing um, a bunch of procedures trying to like um, burn the nerves and stuff like that. Oh yeah, um, but like they they were talking about like fusing some joints together and stuff, and I heard horror stories about that so i never had that done but like my ankles both of them had to be rebuilt like one of my right ankle was literally like every part of it it was basically the skin was just holding it together yeah Um, the doctor actually came out of the surgery and told my wife like i don't know how he was walking because there was just skin holding his foot together um but i i would run on it Mm -hmm. and then I would, it would fully fold over, like, or, like fold under, and I would like step on my ankle joint. Oh my God. Whatever is there. Uh, I'm having like trouble it, listening to this, Chris. <laughs> sideways. And, and then I would just like kind of like skip up and, and go, oh, oh, I'm fine. And it, it didn't hurt at all. It would just, oh, oh, okay. And then I'm good. I'd keep you, running. You probably killed all the nerves in there at some point, huh? Well, one thing I'm lucky enough to have is I have, um, it's like a genetic condition where I don't feel pain the the same way that most oh. people feel it. Um, like I, I feel uh, like a sensation and stuff, but like I remember going through when I was in the SEAL teams, we'd go through these uh, training where, where people would, um, we'd have these experts that would say, you know, oh, if you stick your finger, uh, you know, up in this jaw area right here, yep. you know, you can control somebody, you know, so like nobody could do that on me. And then he had me come up and, 
Uh, he st- stood with his boot on like my bicep when I was on the ground and he's like, okay, so this is like physically impossible to get out of. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, and just twist, twist it out of it. Um, but it, it's hard because I'll go with all these injuries and stuff I've, I've had. I would, yeah. they'd be like, you know, so how, how bad does it hurt? And I'm like, eh, you know, not real bad. You know, so it, it's never really been like excruciating pain, but I've had, I've had to get to the point where like, I kind of have to lie to them. Like, I'm like, okay, like to me, it, it hurts like a four, but I'm guessing on somebody who feels pain normally, it's an eight, you know? So I'm like, oh, it's an eight. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, I guess we'll, we'll do an x-ray because you know, otherwise they wouldn't do x-rays. There, there was a time I was on the Navy pentathlon team and wow. So that's part of, uh, it's called SISM, which is mm-hmm. like the militaries of the world's Olympics. Yep. Uh, so the Navy pentathlon team, you do all these kind of weird uh, different things, swimming, rowing. Um, there's like a biathlon thing. There's an yep. obstacle course. And so I was uh, doing this training. is is a pretty cool time in, in the Navy for me because I spent – it was like eight months just doing two a day workouts Mm -hmm. and like mandatory naps and stuff. So it was pretty cool. But one of the things is you have to do a long jump. So I was running for this long jump and I stretched out and I heard this big snap. It sounded like, like a tree, you know, snapping, breaking a branch. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, uh, it ended up being all three heads of my hamstring on my right leg. And so, so they like drove me to the medical place on base and I got out of the car I was in and I walked in to the doctor's office and I'm like, Hey, I just heard, you know, my hamstrings snap and there's a huge mass of oh, yeah. muscle, uh, like right above the back of my knee. Yep. And, uh, and he's like, well, you couldn't have done that. You would not have been able to walk in here. I'm <laughs> sure you, you know. You strained it, and I'm like, what is that huge mass right at the bottom yeah. uh, of my leg there? Well, you're going to have a lot of swelling. You know, I'm like, can, you know, can you do, do something? Can you do a CAT scan on her? You know, whatever. He's like, oh, you know, you, you're fine. You're, you're walking fine. I'm like, okay. So he's like, you know, come back in <laughs> months if it still is bothering you. So I'm like... Okay, so I, I was, I wasn't the f- best guy on the team. I was actually the slowest guy that made the team. So mm-hmm. after that point, I still had to compete to make it on the team against one other guy, who was ten years younger than me, and uh, and I made it. I beat him without a hamstring. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up. I went to I went to competition, and I must admit, I did terrible in the competition Mm -hmm. um surprisingly in the shooting uh part of it the the part of shooting like Mm -hmm. i think i missed every shot i had to take um i think it's just because of not having a hamstring and having to run you know lay down and i'm like ah yeah so i guess the pain you know probably affected me there but um anyways i went back to to the doctor um six months later and I'm like, look, it still hurts. It's starting to, to hurt my lower back now. And it started mm-hmm. hurting uh, my neck. Like it was just kind of weaving its way up and down my body, how it was. Um, Cause I was walking different. Yeah. Like Everything to, was off. Yeah, I have to use um, my, my um, quads to, um, to like move my leg in a way they're not made to, to move yeah. and my glutes and stuff like, work a lot differently. Um, so anyway, so he finally gave in and, uh, did a, uh, CT scan and found out that they had all three snapped off. One of them luckily attached itself halfway down, like on my femur somewhere. Wow. Yeah. And the muscles had all atrophied so much by that point, there's nothing they could do about it. So it's interesting because whenever I go see a doctor and, the, and and I tell them that they're like, uh, yeah, and I'm like, okay, well, here's the it's a tall tale. Here's the yeah, here's the radiologist report. You know, here's what he said. Here's the pictures of it, and 
you know, like when I get a massage, it's, it's really funny because, you know, they'll, they'll do one leg and they're like, oh, wow, you're, you know, pretty muscular guy here. And then they go to the other leg and they're like, um, what's going on with that? Yeah. Why, why do I feel a bone right here? My, oh, my. <laughs> Well, <laughs> God, I just can't imagine that because I'll tell you what, I've, I've pulled my hamstring a couple times and I'll tell you what, uh, I've, it feels like somebody hits you in the back of the, of the thigh with a baseball bat and uh, it lays me up for a good four to six weeks. Uh, for yeah, sure. the key is to yeah. just snap them all right off and then you never have that problem. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll consider that, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Hey, listen, so uh, when you mustered out, uh, did you have uh, an idea of what you wanted to do afterwards? Because it kind of sounds like that that manifest basically as a result of those heavy, heavy words that your little boy said to you. So, you know, again, I, I know all the guys on the teams, they're they're all about planning. Uh, and, and having uh, backup plans for a backup plan and all that. Did you just decide on the spot to go ahead and do that? What, what happened then? So during that uh, year, um, I did two things while I was getting the surgeries. One was I got to understand the VA system very well. So yeah. that's part of the reason I got 100% disability is not because um, – I did anything wrong, but because, you know, I just understood the code. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like with uh, taxes, you know, if you understand the code, you can save a lot of money yep. and you know, people tend to look at you and go, oh, you're cheating. It's like, no, I understand the rules. Yep. So I took that and I made it into a book um, and I'm going to getting ready to publish that on, you know, how, how to, get your VA disability because it's oh really yeah it's really simple stuff um and i'm gonna give it away to uh my seal brothers and then all proceeds uh profit that i make from it i'm also gonna give uh to seal charities uh, uh, um, hold on before you go any further wh- when is that going to be available and does it have a title yet and i mean um, well, is this going to be a something that you do personally with the guys it's um it's going to be just like I'm going to do it on uh, – it will be a published book, so I'm mm-hmm. hoping to have it like uh, by the end of this year. It's already written. Um, it's just that I'm finishing up another book right now, so I have to get that book finished. Um, so I want that book finished by the, by the fall. Uh-huh. Um, but that's my, my next training book. Uh, new rules of marksmanship manifesto mm-hmm. basically my philosophy on training um but yeah so um it's uh, for a name uh like i was gonna call it like like you know understanding va disability rating stuff mm-hmm. but then i started studying marketing and stuff and uh, and like i'm like it needs to be called like how to get a hundred percent uh, VA disability, what mm-hmm. the government doesn't want you to know. Right. And a lot of people will say, oh, that's cheesy. And it's like, well, yeah, that's that's the kind of title that people are going to want to get, you know. And, mm-hmm. and then I also feel bad, like uh, like it's like I'm flaunting the fact that, that I got 100% disability, but you know, if you look at my my goal is to help other people. Yeah. Um, no, I, then, I got it. The, you, know, you know, military. Yeah. Service yeah. members have been getting hosed by the VA uh, just due to its uh, lack of efficiency, its its inadequacies, and in some of the people that have been in charge uh, for years and years. Uh, I've got a brother who's who's dealing with that uh, all the time, and uh, anything that can. Uh, clear that muddy water and help help the guys that need to uh, 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 have access to that. Uh, you know, who you are on that, too. I mean, yeah. for God's yep. sakes, uh, you know, you guys deserve it. Uh, I, I just don't understand it. I don't understand it. The people that, that deserve it the most uh, get it the least. And uh, hopefully, you know, with Trump and, and some of the maybe the new appointees for the VA, head of the VA, uh, maybe we'll have some headway on on just the general level of uh, attention and service that that uh, that the veterans get. Uh, yeah, you know, so it, all that helps. Yeah. 
so you were, you're uh, saying where, where I was headed, um, mm-hmm. when I was getting out. So, so that was what I was doing the, the last year. I was also, because I had worked with, uh, thermal, uh, devices as a sniper, uh, I knew a lot about thermal imaging and stuff. And I had a company that I was working with and they would send me around with these expensive thermal cameras to these different facilities and places. Um, and it was a pretty sweet deal. Like they're like, Hey, just go bring this, uh, Show them this thermal camera. You don't have to know anything about it, and tell them seal stories. Yeah, and you know we'll pay you a thousand dollars a day. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I got a sweet gig. Yeah, so I I was learning about what these thermal cameras that they had could do and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know how I got into it exactly, but I started a company doing home energy audits, where I would go into a, a house. And look at with my thermal camera and look at the insulation and where it's where it's you know, leaking, yeah, where it's leaking out and and it was uh, super easy. Um, like it, it. I think I charged like three hundred and fifty dollars or something for the mm-hmm. inspection and the report. And and if you didn't make that back within one year, I'd refund your money. Mm-hmm. And nobody cared. I was just so amazed. And, uh, you know, it's probably I didn't understand marketing or how to get the word out, Mm -hmm. but is like people in California talk so much about saving the environment and I want to do this and I want to do all these great things. And I'm like, okay, well, I can help you, you know, save the environment by saving you money and not wasting air conditioning. Um, They're like, nah, I'll just keep paying. (laughs) So, So that didn't didn't work out. Uh, I ended up working for uh, Department of Homeland Security, teaching the Coast Guard Specialized Forces Mm -hmm. uh, how to do like uh, counter narcotic uh, boardings um, for like best like vessels coming in or people running drugs. So Coast Guard guys that take them down Um, during that time is when I started my online stuff. So I just started a blog. just teaching shooting like, Oh, here's an article on shooting. And it it wasn't, I didn't really know what I was doing with it, but it started picking up a a good following. Uh, During that time working, uh, teaching these coasty guys, I ended up became becoming a whistleblower for safety. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they ended up firing me in retaliation and then the office special counsel who lied to the president in their report about the safety stuff when I showed them proof that they lied to the president in the report about safety, they dropped the retaliation charge uh, against the Coast Guard for firing me. Wow. And there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Yeah. I've got like 500 pages of evidence like, <laughs> against them. Um, who was the pre- who was the president at that time? Was that Bush? Are we talking about the president of the United States? It, it yeah. Well, it had nothing to do with who the president was. Um, it ha- it was Obama who, okay. who who the letter went to. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't really even read yeah. it. But basically, when the Office Special Counsel um, puts out their final statement, it's a, it's a it's a letter to Congress and the president. Yeah. It's like an open letter to them that gets posted, uh, you know, online or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it so so their letter said. So basically, what happened was I said, "Hey, these coasty guys are unsafe. I've been trying to make them be safe for like five years, and they're not doing it." So they sent out. Uh, so the office special counsel tells the Department of Homeland Security to investigate the unit that I was at. The Department of Homeland Security tells the U.S. Coast Guard to investigate the unit that I'm at. Mm -hmm. Uh, So then the U.S. Coast Guard Security Services send a guy that is like used to be stationed at the unit that I was at to invest. So basically, the Coast Guard investigated itself on whether it was doing anything unsafe. And with 500 documents of evidence of unsafe acts, uh, they they said they could find uh, nothing 
that the Coast Guard had ever done unsafe. Uh, and they sent that letter to the president. Um, so anyways, mm-hmm. one of the things that they hadn't done in 10 years was get a range safety inspection. So they that was one of the things that they supposedly did this big investigation and said, no, nope, they, they got the inspection. Well, then like a year later, uh, I found out that they did not do the inspection and the oh. Office of Council had... Um, reported to the president that it had. So this is when they ended up firing me uh, from my position. I was a government employee at GS. And um, and then I gave that evidence back to the Office of Special Counsel, and that's when they said, hey, you know what? Um, we're not going to do this retaliation business. We don't see anything here. So there's no way I could, can, because there's no retaliation case, I can't go back to the safety case as I'm yeah. lying in the president. Um, so. Well, now let me ask you, you not to go down that rabbit hole too far, but uh, were you concerned with uh, their actual tactics and uh, some of their, like, clearing a boat or anything like that? Or was it uh, more the training aspect? Uh, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, it was a little bit of everything. Like, it was not uncommon for one of these guys to point a loaded automatic weapon on, you know, selector switch on fire at my chest. Yeah. During training. Yeah. And then looking at me with eyes wide open, not knowing what to do, and me standing there with a whistle in my mouth, not wanting to blow it, which yeah, I would might probably flinch. do. But yeah, I don't want to scare him any more than he already is. Yeah. Uh, and then kicking him off the range um, and then him getting sent back to the range by the command the very next day um, with another instructor that would, that would give him his weapons qualifications so he could deploy. Oh, wow. wow, wow, wow. Or um, they had it, one of their things is like uh, they had to always, what was it? Like every 90 days they had to retest um, so they had to go through like this, this uh, week of training with me mm-hmm. and uh, another GS that worked for me. And we would kind of just review all the stuff they're supposed to know. They'd have some shooting tests and they'd have uh, a little test where they had to go through and do some CQC room clearing and stuff, shooting simunition. And these guys would not practice for it and they would show up and they wouldn't pass and I would go by their grade sheet and I would grade them and they'd fail. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm failing like all these guys. And when it first started off, uh, I realized like people were all upset with me. Well, everybody in the Coast Guard was always upset with me from the day <laughs> of <offer>, But because um, <laughs> I showed up and they're like, OK, here's the guys. Here's how you train them. And here's your grade sheet. And I'm like, OK, Roger that. I can do that pretty good. Um, so. I was doing it and I started failing all these guys. Well, nobody had ever failed before. And they had been doing this training for like, I don't know, 10 years before I got there. Mm -hmm. But their instructors were always just contractors who would show up. And what would happen is if the contractor failed one of one of the coasties, the coasties would complain to the to their command that the instructor was bad. And then the instructor would not get invited back to training. again. Yep. He'd lose his job. job. Yeah. And that that was going on for 10 years. And then I showed up. I was the first one to be hired as a government employee. So they can't fire me. Yeah. Like, right. Uh, They can only apparently fire me for retaliation for being a whistleblower. (laughs) Uh, So so I'm failing these people and and they're like, what's going on? So that I actually started because when I was doing the kind of turnover with the contractor guys, I was like, what's up? Like, why did you just pass this team who did this team evaluation and like they half their team died on the evaluation. And, you know, they, they missed two of the terrorists that were on the boat and they're like, listen, if we fail them, uh, we lose our job. Like they want to us back and explain it all to me. And I'm like, Oh wow, that's pretty bad. Um, so it was, I, I did that for six years and it was just a battle the whole time between, you know, me saying, look, if you want to change the standards on this grade sheet, by all means, do it. It's your grade sheet. But and so they wouldn't change that. They're like, no, no, you grade too hard. And then they're like, okay, come watch me grade. 
and you know they're they're it was just redonkulous it's yeah well let me ask you this 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 is one of those things where you it seems like you have a uh, uh people that aren't are, they're not concerned with the safety of their own uh crews and or you know their the coasties uh, you know, people speak highly of them, and, and they're good guys, uh, I believe, all around. But uh, I'll tell you what, if I was one of your guys that you were training, are you kidding me? Uh, here I got a guy who uh, who's training me that's actually been and done that. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I would be like, I'm going to do everything this guy says, and I'm going to do it to the best uh, of my ability, because if he puts me through this, uh, he's coming from an environment where, you know, the only thing that mattered to him was was saving lives and saving his teammates and not getting anybody shot yeah and you know for the most part the guys i was training were like that um there were some that that didn't get it but for the most part uh guys got it it was the the leadership that they didn't make their guys train so the guys didn't do well and then i would fail them and they would get like the command would get in trouble from their leaders for oh, yeah. people failing. Yeah. Like, Come on, Chris, you got to start passing people. And I'm like, you've got to start making your guys train. Like, and guys would come, it'd be interesting. Everybody who had these guys that would go on, they call them deployments. And I think that's so cute. Cause they're like 30 days. <laughs> I remember when that, when I first sh- showed up and started working with them and talking about deployments and, you know, Oh yeah. Yeah. We've got this deployment coming up. We're going down to Louisiana for 30 days. <laughs> I'm like, listen, if you have a three G service, it's not a deployment. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, I, it, it always pains me when I, when I hear stories that, uh, are about people uh, that are willing to do what they need to do, be that you and or the guys that are under you that are willing to do that too. But then they run into these people that are up the flagpole that uh, uh, are just, I guess in a word, incompetent or, or not, uh, they, they shouldn't, uh, they're not doing their job. And, uh, you know, I, I guess that's the way of the world. And, and in any, any bureaucracy, uh, you know, it, it reminds me of that damn uh, movie with Clint Eastwood, Danny. I uh, remember it was uh, uh, the one where, where Clint was a Marine uh, recon. I can't remember the movie. It was I think it was about the when they went to Grenada. And uh, they had that uh, capture the flag. And uh, Clint's team got up there, and they, they wiped out the other guys and got the flag. And they were red team. Or, and uh, one of the other commanders steps up, and he goes, blue team wins. Because he, <laughs> you know, even though they they had lost badly, uh, he wasn't going to let that be reflected on his record, and uh, it was just kind of one of those funny moments. But hey, yeah. Chris, let's get let's get off to uh, w- take me through when you uh, uh, first started uh, the evolution of that from the uh, online stuff that you were just kind of doing as a blog uh, to where you actually were uh, starting to have students and stuff like that to. Uh, teach skills to yeah so the the blog thing like it took off um by itself like i you know i just did it because i was uh when i retired i had written the seal sniper manual so like i was Mm -hmm. i loved instruction and stuff so it was just kind of like i had this excess information in me and i think it was because i was trying to give this information to the coasties and they would have no part of it i'm like okay well i gotta release it somewhere give it somewhere Um, and I, so I had a a good following with my blog and that's about all I was doing with it. I was doing some, uh, instruction for like civilians and law enforcement, uh, just taking them to the range. You know, I didn't really have anything like set up, like, you know, every week I wasn't doing it, but, um, people could hire me to do it. And I had a friend of mine who was a marketer. And he's like, you need to have a book. You know, if you have a book, it's like going to be awesome. It's like a calling card for you. And, and I was like, yeah, I can't write a book. And then he, he looks at my website and he's like, well, you have right here a seven part series uh, on marksmanship. 
He goes, those are seven chapters. You write an introduction and, uh, and an ending chapter to that, and you've got a book. You've got a book. Yeah, so I was like, huh. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I, I didn't know what to do with it. He's like, he's like, you just make a PDF, and you, and you put it on your website, and you sell it for 47 bucks. And I was like, I'm going to sell a PDF not even paper to people online for $47. No one is going to buy that. And he's like, and you know, he, he, he talked me into it. I'm like, he's like, Hey, if nobody buys it, nobody buys it. Who cares? Yeah. You know? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. So I put it up there, $47. And it just started going off. Like, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. I'm like, this cost me no money at all to do. I'm just making yeah. money. Like it was, it was the craziest thing ever. Uh, so that's why, like, I'm all into marketing now and stuff. Yeah. You know, but if you look at it, I'm not like uh, people. This is how it was explained to me, and it makes sense to me. Is I'm not selling like when you buy a book, you're not buying paper. You're buying value. Yep. So the fact that you're getting a PDF, a, a piece like electronic stuff, you're getting energy that could yep. disappear. You know, you're, you're not, it's, that doesn't matter. You're getting the value of it. And with a PDF, you know, delivered as, as soon as you hit the buy button, you were reading and you're learning. Yep. Uh, and one of the things I did that I think really helped when I wrote that book was while I was writing it, um, I was like just having a really hard time kind of describing some of the like intricate movements of doing like a magazine reload or whatever. And I was like, man, I wish I had a, a way to like have a video of, of this. Cause even if still pictures aren't going to describe yeah. it. Well. And then I, I was like, wait a minute, if I'm doing an online PDF, I can put hyperlinks in there to videos. Yep. So I put like hidden uh, private videos on YouTube and do a set of uh, uh, videos for the book. So, Hey, if you buy the book, you also get these 12 uh, free videos, mm -hmm. which now I have it set up on, on my website where it comes with uh, a quiz at the end. And so it's kind of like a course and stuff. You get a certificate if you pass. But, um, I think that's really what set it apart was it's like, okay, I'm getting this immediate value right now from the guy who wrote the sniper manual um, who probably knows a little bit about teaching others. Um, and, you know, I'm going to get videos of it, uh, being able to watch him do it. And so that went really well. And then that turned into people going, oh, I want a, I want a print copy. So I ended up going uh, to Amazon. They have a printing service called Create Space. So mm -hmm. I just sent them my PDF, and then they, it's print on demand. Which, if you're on Amazon, you don't even know it's print on demand, but but it is. But it is. Uh, it's on demand now is like instant. So hey, let, uh, let me stop you for a second. Uh, yep. I heard that that book became the number one bestseller in that category on Amazon. Is that is that? Did I hear right? You did. Yeah. There's a lot that goes on with that. Like one one thing I was. Um, I'm a big proponent of like. Uh, visualization and um, like positive thinking. Uh, I have a vision board that I have. It's on my iPad and it's, it's pictures of things that are going to happen in my future. So that was one of the things I had gone in when I first, uh, when I first got published on Amazon, I went to the shooting like section and I, I did a copy, a screen, grab copy of the like number one bestseller and I took the I copied out like photoshopped my book into that spot and then I put that picture as one of my vision board ah. pictures so every day when I would meditate I go I meditate and then I look at my vision board and I just picture it like this is my life this is my life you know I probably always have like 20 different pictures that I see you know like the yeah. house that I'm been places I'm going to visit stuff like that but this was one of them and I remember one day I, I went went downstairs turned on my computer I'm like oh let's see how it's selling and there it is the exact picture that I was um, seeing every day when I was meditating uh, I was number one bestseller and I was like wow so I 
you know, upswipe and delete that picture and move on to the next one. But I was actually, it was pretty cool. I, for 18 months straight, it was the number one book. Um, there, there's another uh, book right now that beat my record on that one. Um, but uh, pretty proud of that. So that was a while. Uh, wow. Amazon's huge, uh, and uh, to, to hold it even for one day is, a, is an accomplishment, let alone 18 months. I, I got I to tell you, when you say that about uh, uh, having those things and visualizing them and, and all that, it reminds me of a story. Uh, Bruce Lee, actually, uh, at one time uh, when he was, uh, I think he was still on the Green Hornet. This goes way back to the, to the 60s. And uh, he had written down that he wanted to be, or that he would be, he wrote down that he would be the biggest movie star on, on the planet Earth. And uh, lo and behold, uh, several years later, when I believe Enter the Dragon came out, uh, at that time, you know, we're not talking about the biggest movie star in the United States, you know, uh, we're talking about the world. And when that movie came out, uh, he beat out, I think it was Paul Newman and... Uh, Someone else uh, were the were the top international stars, and mm-hmm. because of because he was a Chinese and uh, the martial arts movies uh, appealed to everyone. Uh, when it came to worldwide uh, number one status, he was the number one movie star in the entire world. But he his life was built around those same types of affirmations and that uh, ability to uh, you know he was one of those guys and. and and, and I actually learned from him, not personally, but uh, as an example, uh, I do the same thing. And, and it's kind of like what you're doing. I, I write down, what am I going to do tomorrow? What are my goals for the next six months? What am I, where am I going to be a year from now? Uh, what do I want to do down the road in the future? And I think that uh, there's something about just having those goals. A lot of people are just kind of adrift. They're in a boat that's just going wherever that river takes them. Yeah, I think that's something I tell people all the time is I'm just so amazed. And uh, when people hear this, I love seeing their eyes light up like, oh, wow, there there might be something to this. But how many people wake up every morning and just let the whole day happen to them? You know, they're just in reaction to anything that's happening to them. And then it's the end of the day and they're going, oh, I didn't get anything done today. I had a terrible day. Like, what if you woke up? every morning and said, Hey, today's going to be an awesome day. And here's why I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this. Yep. And then you start your day off, like telling yourself, we all tell ourselves, you know, what we're going to do. We're, we're, we're the, we're the stories that we tell ourselves. So, yep. you know, what story are you telling yourself or, or are you just living in reaction to what other people tell you are supposed to happen to your day? Well, it's, it's funny because right here in front of me, I have my to to do today list, and of course your podcast is on it. Uh, but uh, I think there's a, there's you know the the goal and reward system is is the best way to train any kind of animal. Uh, there is a huge reward. I, I'm I don't know how to describe it. I know you're going to know what I'm talking about when I draw a line through i I list them like one to 12 or whatever i got in there when i draw a line through something i there i don't know if it's an endorphin release or whatever but i feel (laughs) there you go (laughs) he just showed me his uh to-do list uh, on the camera here Um, yeah and going back to saying what's gonna happen in your future and people that aren't watching on your news you can can you read that Yes, I see. I think it says $10, $10 million on it. <laughs> yeah, so that's a check that I wrote to myself uh, two, a little over two years ago. Yeah. Ten million check, so looking forward to cashing that. But I, I bet you uh, are. <laughs> my desk here. Invite me over for that uh, celebration party. <laughs> yeah, that, that, one, that one I have to give credit to. I think it's Jim Carrey did mm-hmm. that. He wrote himself a, a $10 million check and he put it in his wallet or something. I yeah. think it, I, I've heard that story from somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, now, you know what? Let's get into, let's get into some of the nuts and bolts about uh, some of the shooting stuff they're doing. Oh, you know what? I wanted to ask you a question too. Uh, as, uh, cause you mentioned sniper several times and, uh, of course, uh, that involves a long gun. And I think, uh, you know, most civilian classes, I think most people are uh, probably interested in training with a pistol. 
uh, just for self-defense and or concealed carry or whatever. But I, very seldom do I get to ask anybody, um, and, and I know you guys are deployed with the, with the M4s or whatever uh, long rifles that, that you carry uh, you know, when you're uh, uh, on deployment, but did you ever have to use a pistol in combat? Uh, Do you ever have to go to the? No, no. Because yeah. I'm just curious. Because you know, again, most soldiers, uh, you know, their primary weapon is is the long gun. But we spend a lot of time. Yeah, with I, I, I in. Um, I, I don't like talking about my deployments, but so I, I try to Roger figure that. out word this without saying anything. But doing personal protection stuff mm-hmm. that that we also do. Yep. You know, besides going and kicking in doors like a lot of times that is just with a pistol yeah oh okay well that makes perfect sense because everything has to be kind of covert and 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 uh not but obtrusive the, uh, and there's yeah. times when you when you do want to show a great presence of force but, oh yeah yeah well, yeah it is um you know like i i teach using mostly like pistol and carbine mm-hmm. uh, with the stuff I'm teaching right now. And I do that because like you said, most people, that's what they want to learn. Yeah. I send, I send out a survey to, to people who join my online membership and I've had, so now I've got probably answers from like 3000 people. And, you know, I ask like, what do you want to learn? And I th- like, there's literally been like four people who have said they wanted to learn long gun. Yeah shooting so it's just it doesn't make sense for me to to focus on that but the the way that i teach i really what i teach is a way to learn mm-hmm. i call it the new rules of marksmanship and i developed it because when i was retired and i was teaching law enforcement civilians i was teaching them the same way that i had taught seals same techniques like same drills whatever and it wasn't working and people were like, you know, just not getting it. And I finally, it took me a while, but I realized when I was running the sniper course, I was teaching warriors how to do something. Mm-hmm. So I could have been, you know, teaching them using a samurai sword. I could have been teaching them needlepoint, yep. you name it. They're, they're ready to learn. They understand learning. They have a des- desire to learn. Um, and, I realized what I needed to do is I needed to teach people to how to learn and how to become warriors themselves. So uh, the first thing I teach everybody, if you want to learn from me on how to, how to shoot is meditation. So probably half the people that show up at my site that want me to teach them. um, And then they see they're going to have to learn how to meditate. You know, they probably go away and they're like, Oh, it's it's not for me. It's like, okay. (laughs) So having a clear, focused mind is not for you. All right. <laughs> you know, I, I got it, though, because, you know, what you've just uh, put together is almost, uh, in most people's mind, uh, the opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, meditation is the guy with the long hair sitting in the, uh, the beads around his neck. That, you know, we still have that kind of connotation, I guess. Uh, but, uh, and, and I think you and I have had this conversation before, uh, almost every single top performer in almost any field, whether it's athletics or, or in the military or even in business. Uh, I mean, you and I talked about it. Uh, meditation is a large part of their daily routine. Yeah. And I, I tell people like, I get it, like the, the kind of stigma that some people have with it, but just call it something else, you know, call it brain performance training or, or mental focus training you know, whatever, just call it something different if you have a problem with meditation. Mm-hmm. But you mentioned the the differences, the extreme ends of the spectrum uh, that people think that meditation and shooting are so, so different. But when you look at it from a warrior aspect, um, if you want to be able to, to, to be a, a warrior, you need to have a focused, clear mind. Um, and like one of the things I do is I teach uh, the traits of a warrior, and I say there's six hard traits and six soft traits, mm-hmm. and be balanced in both of those traits. Um, and if you're not, if you're imbalanced in that, then you have problems. But having teaching meditation has really been interesting because with shooting, I was introduced 
to uh, Deepak Chopra's, um, the guy that runs his business, Mm -hmm. or his son wanted to be, wants to be on the uh, Indian uh, Olympic rifle team. So he asked me to train him. So I started training him. And then his dad finds out I'm teaching him, talking, well, I'm not teaching him because he knew about meditation, but I'm, you know, explaining to him how meditation is going to help with the shooting and stuff. So, um, so he tells Deepak Chopra in conversation, Hey, there, check this guy out. He's teaching meditation and shooting together. Mm-hmm. So I got to meet Deepak Chopra and talk about this. So we're actually oh, wow. um, working together on doing some training uh, about being a uh, you know, like a balanced warrior and, and, mm-hmm. and uh, teaching businesses. So going to businesses and going, listen, you need to be, have the soft side of meditation and, but check, check it out here. Here's a Navy SEAL who also gets strength from meditation, you know? So, yeah. so it's not, so it's not all just that fluff and foo-foo. Roger that. Things. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, that would be a, a very good selling point. In other words, here we've got a real warrior uh, who is showing us uh, that meditation is, is of great benefit. Because, again, you know, believe me, I'm sure the, the kind of people that you hang out with are, are a lot like the kind of people I hang out with. If we brought somebody in here, uh, Danny, to uh, teach us meditation and they, and they had uh, – uh, that stereotypical uh, thing that I'm talking about, the the kind of the uh, the, the yoga we'd pa- run them out on a rail y- yoga pants thing. It'd be it'd be tough to uh, it'd be tough to digest or, or to to open up the doors to let their information in, it, it valid or not. Uh, but when uh, somebody like you can come along and say, "Hey, man, you know what? I, I'm who I am, and and this is what meditation can do for you." That that's a whole different uh, presentation. Yeah, it's funny. I was uh, I have a did a, a pilot for a TV show called fire team six. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if anybody listening knows a good home for an awesome TV show, action education, uh, let me know. Yeah. So we've got, we filmed this pile, but when we we're doing it, I was working, I was filming in Georgia, a big uh, film production company down there. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but there mm-hmm. I started, it, it, you know, it was basically like cameras on. Okay, go ahead start teaching. And I start talking about meditation. And I'm like, you know, okay, so you need to focus the mind and meditation. And he's like, cut, cut. <laughs> and, hey, uh, hey, hey, Chris. Um, yeah, I don't know if you know it there, buddy, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're down in the south here. Uh, <laughs> tone it down with the with the meditation. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to be buying it around here. I'm like, okay. Um, Hey, we're going to learn to clear our minds. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I can see that. And, uh, but, you know, it's, again, it's part of that being able to focus. Uh, think about it. Uh, Zen archery, uh, a samurai. I mean, a, a samurai soldier would go into, or a samurai warrior would go into battle. Uh, someone was going to die. Uh, you know, it wasn't like uh, you were just spraying a uh, bullet someplace or anything like that and, and hoping that you hit something. Uh, if you engage in combat with a samurai sword, uh, someone was going to – the other guy, you know, it's a zero-sum uh, uh, game. Yeah. And uh, look at how much of their training is spent on meditation. And, I mean – there'd be no better uh, example of that that I can come up with anyway offhand uh, than a samurai warrior uh, and, and a testimony to the effectiveness of that because uh, the philosophies and things that we all read about and hear about, uh, you know, Masashi and all of those kind of guys, uh, you know, they spent years meditating. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, those were some warriors, that's for dang sure, so... Hey, listen. Let's let's get off that for a moment. Uh, what are you doing right now? What's what's the state of your business? Uh, tell you know. Tell tell us what's what's going on. Uh, what do you have to offer? Uh, oh, I got it all. What do I you got doing? it. <laughs> That's it. After my Soup first to nuts. Book, yeah. 
Exactly. After my first book, I, I my my second shooting book is um, called Navy Seal Shooting, and that is still, I think, um, haven't checked in a while, but the highest rated shooting book ever on Amazon, and that's oh, out wow. of seven thousand books on shooting. So, um, pretty proud of that. So definitely go either on Amazon to pick that up or you come to my website, chrissignog.com and go to the shop and you can get a signed uh, hardcover, full color uh, signature edition of that, uh, my site. Um, but the big thing I'm doing right now is I have a membership site, m- monthly membership. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an amazing uh, community. And so I do like l- every month I do live uh, video training. Yep. So- I call it a hangout because I basically clear out all my weapons and get set up with a bottle of wine. And I have uh, actually my neighbor, Matt, comes over and he's like my co-host. And he, you know, asks me the questions to demonstrate this or answer that. And we, we have a great time drinking wine and hanging out. Like I love my members and, Heck you know, yeah. like I, whenever I travel and stuff, I tell them where I'm at and if, you know, if we can hook up and hang out. Uh, we do that. So, so that's pretty big. Um, Listen, let me, let me, let me break in for just one second. Just say this. I I have that book, uh, and it is signed by you. And and I'll tell you what, it's, it is way more than the mechanics of, uh, how to manipulate a weapon and where to point it. Uh, in that book, Chris, you, you go through a lot about the mindset. You go through a lot about, uh, you know, the focus and energy that you have to have, a. uh, uh, directed towards that goal and uh so i gotta say hey that that is a great book uh hands down i refer to it uh, often uh in different things so uh just wanted to throw that in there for you man oh thanks man i appreciate it yeah it's it's it i just have a totally different way of looking at training um and and i developed it because like i said when i was uh trying to train other people and it wasn't working, I'm like, I need to figure out a new way to do this. So I, I studied great athletes and musicians and chess grandmasters and how did they actually learn? Like what was their learning process? Mm-hmm. Not like the, the mechanics, uh, uh, you know, of this is how you hold a golf club, you know, like I studied golf and stuff and like, yeah, how, how, you have to have the mechanics. I agree. Did you, you know, proper foundation for, for the physical part yeah, of it. But, but like everybody has the mechanics, yep. like you can go on YouTube and you can, you could see a, a thousand people showing you how to hold a pistol Yep. and, and oh, this is how you do it. Okay. So I know how to do it, but that's not the problem. And I say it like the example I give is like Michael Jordan. Like you don't hear anybody talk about Michael Jordan and being so good because he held his right hand at a 45 degree angle when he shot a basketball. Right. Nobody mm-hmm. has ever I've never heard anybody I've never heard that talk about because of any mechanics that he did. It all has to do with how he trained. Yeah. And if you look back at anyone great at anything, nobody's great at what they're what they're good at. I mean, besides maybe like Fosbury with the flop when he was the only one who knew how to do it for a couple of weeks yeah. or whatever. You know, then it was a mechanics thing. But it's now it after everybody understands the mechanics, which in shooting you know, mechanics are mechanics. The laws of physics are not different for anybody here on earth. Yeah. So, so that's like, we don't need to focus on that. Like, I don't, I don't care if you use my method for how to, how to stand when you shoot or you use somebody else's, as long as you train properly, mm-hmm. you'll, you'll, you'll you can shoot just fine. But the traditional way that firearms instruction has, has always been, and it's interesting because I just did a podcast. I have a podcast that I started about this and about how is one of my members was saying, why is it in shooting that people think you can go to a two day course and watch somebody else do something. And then you're instantly going to be better. You know, it'd be like, Oh, Hey, I want to go to UFC. Hey, there's a, there's a two day, uh, jujitsu, uh, course that I'm going to go through and then I'm going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, like, you need to like, hit the gym like every day for like 10 years that's how, how you're going to get good at it um so, so that's what i teach is i teach you know a new way to learn like i think that the worst the worst way to learn in the way that most people do it is if you want to learn to shoot you get a gun you go to the range 
Uh, you load it up. Probably somebody you know that knows something about, about a gun hopefully loads it up and hands it to you. And it's like, hey, don't point this at yourself or anybody else or somebody's going to die. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't know how to stand. You don't know how to hold the gun. You don't know how to focus. You don't know how to manipulate the trigger. You don't know anything, but you're just going to slap that trigger like it owes you money mm-hmm. and then hope for the best. And what people, what happens is that people, um, they flinch because of, you know, they're not ready for it. And as soon as you do something one time, you are building a neural pathway for your, for your body to be able to do that quickly again. And when people talk about muscle memory, that's what it is. Um, and for you to be able to learn properly, you need to learn under low stress. So I have people do dry fire training. Like I do like a 30 day dry fire challenge where if, if you're a new shooter, dry fire for 30 days, learn how to shoot before you actually go to the range and then shoot. And you'll like, I've been doing, telling people this for five years now and everybody it works for everybody. I've had people who had had a flinch for, for 30 years because they didn't learn properly. And I'm like, listen, don't shoot a gun for 30 days. Every day I want you to just dry fire practice with your gun, just relax, do some meditation. Mm -hmm. And every time 30 days later, they're like, Chris, I'm amazed. Like I've never shot like this in my life. Well, uh, you know what? It's funny you bring that up because, uh, I was I was made aware of a study a long long time ago, and it had to do with a psychology class. And uh, the instructor uh, split the class in half and had them go to the basketball uh, to the gym. And uh, they brought in one of the basketball players, and he showed everyone how to shoot a free throw. And then what he did was he had uh, half the class go uh, like two or three times a week and shoot free throws, and then he had half the class uh, go once a week. Uh, to shoot free throws, but spend time visualizing, just like they're watching a movie in their head, shooting those free throws. And at the end of the uh, uh, the time period that, with, that they went through the study on, uh, the kids that shot uh, every day or whatever uh, at the gym, actually practicing the free throws, uh, did not shoot as well as the kids who shot a tenth of the time uh, on the court but had practiced visually and and the key was this chris when you when you in your mind shoot a free throw every single one is pure net so inside your body mind connection you're practicing perfection every time as opposed to me standing there and uh, shooting a free throw from the line and uh, hitting the front of the rim or off to the side or whatever, I'm actually practicing imperfection right. and, and locking that in. I, is that kind of where you're going with what with that flinch? Yeah, there? I've, I've read that study. That's that's exactly the type of things that I spent basically four years studying. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know how how we actually learn and how how our brains work, uh, how the neurons work in our brains, how how the myelin. Uh, coats yep. our neural yep. pathways and uh, how to reinforce that and make it stronger with emotion and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's, you know, that's what I teach. And it's like, actually it's, it's been kind of interesting because I, it's, it's like, I'm, people ask me what I do and it used to be pretty easy. Like, Oh, I teach shooting online. Well, at first it wasn't easy. Like, wait a minute, shooting online. I'm like, yeah, it really works. Um, you know, but then it's like, okay, i I knew I could do it and I was doing really well doing it online because there's a variety of reasons why it's better uh, to learn online than Mm -hmm. me teaching you how to range. Um, Like one interesting reason is like I always say, I've been teaching shooting to alpha males for 25 years now. And I, I I'll do it. If I'm at a range, I'll do a demonstration and then I'll be like, okay, any questions? How many people do you think in 25 years of these alpha males in front of others have raised their hand and said, yes, Chris, I don't understand that. <laughs> Zero. Exactly. I don't know if I'd raise my hand. <laughs> so, but online, like I know right now that two of my members are police chiefs and they told me that they couldn't um, and I don't use their names, but they, yeah. they both, because that's why they're, they did it online is because they said, I can't go to my firearms instructor and tell them I, 
I'm concerned I'm not going to pass my test. Yeah. You, you, when yes. you're in, a, in an authority position, you don't want to give up that, uh, that image or that, or that, you know, yeah. if you're leading the guys, you gotta, you gotta stand tall and, 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 and play the part. But I can see that with the anonymity, anonymity of being able to, uh, uh, not have, to, not be embarrassed, so to speak or whatever, uh, yeah. that you get yeah, a lot more honesty. Yeah. And there's just tons of reasons, you know, like it, it, in with doing it online, if I do a demonstration, it, you see video angles from, you know, different cameras I have set up. You can oh, watch yeah. it over, and over again. When you're at a shooting course, you may get to lean over somebody's shoulder and watch a demonstration, you know, of the instructor doing something once. And then you're like, what? Oh, I didn't see that, but yeah. I don't want to act like I didn't see that. Okay. Yeah. Huh. You know, and guys just go up to the line and start shooting. And you've got like one instructor watching like 10 people. Yeah. Like, so every time those nine people that aren't being watched make a mistake, they're getting worse. Yeah. They're practicing in perfection uh, yeah. once again. Yeah. So, so with that, so I, you know, now when people ask me, well, what do you do? I'm like, well, I, I don't really think I'm a firearms instructor. Like I think I'm, I teach people how to learn or I teach people how to live like warriors. And I use uh, firearms as kind of uh, like a, instrument to yep. demonstrate how it works like mm-hmm. and it's just been really interesting like i'll get testimonials all the time that are like yeah chris made me a better firearm uh, shooter like mm-hmm. lot, way better than i ever thought but the most amazing part is i'm a better person i'm a better father i'm a better husband and i can learn anything faster uh using what he teaches so well it's, you know what let me let me just uh, add something to that, and it's something that I picked up uh, in in my life, is that the best coaches, the ones that are the the iconic figures in in sports history, were always more concerned about producing a quality individual than they were about a winning team. And by producing quality individuals, they produced winning teams. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you and I both know about Vince Lombardi <laughs> being from yep. Wisconsin. Uh, he, he's one of the epitomes of that. And there's a whole bunch of other coaches. But, uh, yeah, you know, those guys didn't t- – they taught, they taught life. And they, yeah. t- they taught you to be a better person because you could have a bunch of scuff laws on your team and they could have all kinds of skills. They're not going to get it together and they're not going to perform together as a team at a, at a high level of performance. Uh, but if you if you teach people how to be better people, the, any product that you're after, any goal that you're after, you're going to end up with a better result. Yeah, I I also use uh, Lombardi when because people like I don't have on YouTube is the decision I made a while ago when I first started my YouTube channel was uh, I don't shoot any firearms on any of my videos. I don't link to any companies that sell firearms or ammunition. Mm-hmm. That's the reason my YouTube channel is still up where other firearms channels are getting taken down. Um, so I don't know what kind of foresight I had there, but, you know, it was good and it's worked out. But I still will have people like, oh, you know, let's see how good you can shoot, you know, oh. like call, calling me out. And I'll tell people I'm, you know, probably not a great shooter right now because guess what? I don't practice shooting. I practice teaching others. Yeah. I said, but you go on my YouTube channel and go to the, uh, the area where I have my testimonials and you look at the 20 or so video testimonials I have from my students yeah, and, and then go look at, you know, go search for the best shooter uh, on YouTube, you know, whoever he is, there's yeah. different shooters better than me. And, but look at their testimonial section. Yeah. 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 They're non-existent because th- being able to shoot, well, is does not translate at all, you know, anything. In life. Yeah, yeah. So I always say, like, you know, would you ask Vince Lombardi to throw a football before you let him coach you on how to do it? Yeah. Let's see how good you are, Vince. <laughs> yeah. Come on, prove it to me. Well, look, look at, uh, here's a perfect example. Uh, Muhammad Ali was a good boxer, but he wouldn't have been Muhammad Ali without Angelo Dundee. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's that same story. Uh, you know, I, I, I was going to say uh, something about the uh, um, 
geez, I don't know. I, 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 I've got so many thoughts running through my head right now with the, with the things that you're talking about. But, uh, you know, I think like what you're saying is you, you teach, you're teaching people how to learn. And uh, that's an important thing that's a, that's a skill that I think a lot of people don't, they don't carry with them. Uh, I mean, we, you know, as a business person, uh, you know, interviewing people for jobs and all that, uh, and then seeing those people on the floor, uh, there's some people that, uh, that, that can learn. Uh, and then there's people that I'm telling you, it's, it, it, it's almost like you have to break through a, a, the hard coconut shell to even get information into them. And now that might be my fault, uh, because I'm not presenting it in a way that, uh, uh is the way to get to those people because I think you know anybody can be educated, and, and sometimes it's it's a matter of how that uh, information is being presented. And I think you know if I if I'm if I could be so bold, I think that's what your your goal is eventually in in this life journey that you're after is figuring out what's the best way to get that information uh, into that individual. Yeah, it's definitely where I'm headed and like one of the big things you, that you mentioned with getting people um, to break through to them. One of the biggest things that I've found is people's, uh, the beliefs that we have about ourselves. So for instance, I, I get probably 20 emails a day that people will just randomly email me and say, Chris, I need help. I, uh, um, I always shoot low and left. And it's like, okay, so that's the story you're telling yourself. So what do you think happens every time you go to the range <laughs> and you go to shoot? Your, your body is going to want to make your mind correct. Yep. So you're going to shoot low and left. I promise you, you will. It's like, you know, if you, if you say don't hit, the curb when, don't hit the curb when you're riding your bike, guess what? You're going to hit the curb. Yep. And it happens every time. But our beliefs almost all the time come from uh, when we're – kids you know or Mm -hmm. if you've been shooting for a long time it it started the first time you're at the range and and you you shot poorly and somebody looked over at you and said oh wow you're really bad and now that just sticks in your head i am yeah you're not you're you're like oh i'm a bad shooter i'm a bad shooter and whether it's a conscious thing or not it's still it's still locked in yeah and so so you you have these beliefs and, and we all have them and but we need to realize hey wait a minute is my belief, I can change it to whatever I want to believe. But a, a lot of stuff I talk about too is like cognitive dissonance. When you have two conflicting ideas in your mind, and like say for instance, uh, your grandfather taught you how to shoot and he taught you a certain way to, to put your, uh, the tip of your finger on, on the trigger. Like grandpa said, hey son, when you, Grandson, when you shoot, this is where it's got to go, right there on the pad of your finger. And you say, okay, Grandpa, and then you shoot. And then, you know, 30 years later, this Navy SEAL comes along and says, hey, listen, you need to make sure you have a good grip on your gun because that's why your gun's going to move around is because you don't have a grip. And, you know, that whole tip of the finger thing, that came from professional shooters that have heavy guns and light triggers But with your defensive gun right there, you have a light gun with a very heavy trigger. So it's the opposite. So that little tip of the finger thing is not going to work. You need a good grip. Put your finger wherever it lands on that uh, trigger comfortably. And then look at this. Mechanically, if you keep your second knuckle pointed straight at your target, it's impossible to push or pull your gun left or right without this knuckle moving left or right. And you hear all this information. You're like, wow, that really sounds that makes sense. Like that, that's like science and stuff. Mm-hmm. But grandpa told me something different. So I'm not going to do that. Well, you yeah. know, but it's but funny. You don't, you don't consciously say that though. You know, it's not a conscious yeah. thing. Grandpa said that it's a, it's a belief from long ago. From way back. You, you don't even know why you're like, I don't know why Chris, but, uh, not going to do it. You, you know, that's interesting. I, I, the priority is the grip. And, mm-hmm. and why would you compromise anything? Um, I, I, it's, it's the first time I've had anybody describe what you've just said, because I'm part of that, the proper uh, position on the pad of the finger and all that. Yep. And, uh, I mean, what good it's, is that going to do if my yeah. grip is loose? Yeah, this is, it, this is great, because this is like the reason. I'm learning. 
yeah, people go, how do you teach shooting online? That's impossible. I'm like, <laughs> what just happened right here? I you just know? learned online. Yeah. Like I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've got a system. It works. You can argue with it if you want. But I, I think part of the problem, too, is that people have a problem with changing their mind. You know, like there's a big thing like being a flip flopper or, or, you know, oh, yeah. whatever. And and we, we fight against it. Like anytime there's any change in our life, we are hardwired to fight against change. So so as a species, we've survived because it's it's hardwired inside of us to detect, deflect and defend. So if there's something out of the ordinary in the environment, we need to be able to detect it. Oh, what's that? And then something comes at you real quick. You're going to deflect it, mm-hmm. right? Hands go up. Ah! Yep. And then in the end, you're going to you're going to work to defend yourself. Well, it's this. You know, we're not in the jungles anymore with saber tooth tigers chasing us. But when we detect something's different, oh, this information, this is a little different. It kicks in. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's not conscious, but you know, your subconscious is like, wait a minute, this is different. And, and then you don't want to change and you'll deflect it and you'll go, ah, well, you know, I'm not, I don't have time to practice that or, mm-hmm. oh, this isn't going to work, you know. Um, and then you defend against it like, oh, what do, you, what do you know? Yeah, you can't teach people to shoot online. Well, you know what? It's that it, we've, we've actually built it even into our vernacular, the, the way that we talk about it. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. That's bullshit. No. And uh, whoops! I swore that that's <laughs> that was for effect. This interview's over. This interview's over. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Uh, y- yes, you can. And, and I'm, believe me, I'm an old dog. And uh, I'll tell you what: the thing, think about it. Waffling does that have a does that have a good uh, connotation? No. Uh, being indecisive, you know, those kind of things. And, and again, that can be a bad uh, uh, personality trait. But when it comes down to look, Chris. I may have done something the same way, no matter what it is, business, martial arts, uh, I don't care what the subject is. You show me a better way to do it, I'm on. I'm on. Yeah, well, that, that's good for you, and, and hopefully we can help spread this word to other people to be open to that. And I think sometimes when I describe to people like, hey, you, do you understand that for you to learn anything, you have to change your mind? Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. You, like that is what learning learning is changing your mind. You thought one thing before, and now you think something different. Like if you if that didn't happen, you didn't learn. You didn't learn. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's you have to change. And, and sometimes people people hear that and go, "Oh, wow, okay, wow, I need to change." Yeah. And, yeah. I've seen people just completely like flip flop there. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, okay. Wait, change is a good thing. Yeah. I've always thought that, and, and it's it's something that also I think it just refreshes. Well, think about this, and, and uh, yeah, when they, when they uh, um, and I'm sure you've heard about this too, where they'd go to a, a quote unquote old folks home, and then they would uh, they'd have them do a test, like maybe a mathematics test or something like that, and then they would uh, start teaching them a new skill, whether it was a musical instrument or uh, a, a learn a new language or or challenge them with something physically. Uh, do that for a period of time. Go back and take the math test again. The math test they scored higher on. Uh, it, it's a it's again. And there's a lot of reasons for all of that, but if you challenge your mind constantly and and create that learning process, it, it's a, like a tide that that raises all the boats. Uh, and it's interesting when you say that, uh, uh, you, it hit me hard when you said, uh, hey, I took uh, the stuff that from your book or from the online stuff, and it made me a better father, a better husband, uh, a better leader. Uh, that's that That's that tide. Uh, that you've set in motion, and uh, I got to tell you, yeah. uh, Chris, we, we've 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 been talking about this stuff for uh, an, an hour and a half now, and uh, I'm telling you, I could go on for probably a, another couple, two or three hours. But uh, would you be willing to come on again at some point in the future and, and talk some more about uh, if we got like deep into some of the learning processes and, and uh, things that you've touched on today? I think we've been a little uh, we've we've hit a lot of stuff, but man, I'll tell you, there's some deep deep layers in there that we could dig into if you're if you'd be up for it. I uh, definitely would be. Just let me know when. 
Yeah, well, you know what? I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm greedy. And uh, <laughs> I want to have this conversation. I don't care about the people out there listening. <laughs> I'm kidding, guys, really. I, I, I get excited about stuff, and I always think, look, I'm just an average guy. And if something really, you know, spins my wheels, uh, I, I think it'll, it'll really touch base with a lot of, of the people that, that, uh, that, we're, that we deal with or that are around uh, the Emerson uh, uh, world, I guess. And, uh, Chris, I think this has been a, a wonderful time to talk about all this stuff. Definitely. Uh, yeah. But like I said, it's, it's, we've just scratched the surface, and uh, I, can't, I couldn't wait to maybe have you on again. We'll, we'll be in touch about all that. But now, last thing, uh, can you uh, – is there anything that you're doing right now that you want to promote? Uh, your website, I want to have you uh, tell us all about that, you know, just how to get a hold of you, uh, where we can find you, uh, any, anything that you want to – you want to make sure that the guys out here and the gals uh, 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 are made aware of before we sign off. Sure. So um, unfortunately I have a hard last name to spell, which is S A J N O G. And so my main website is Chris Sinog.com C H R I S S A J N O G.com. Um, but most people probably aren't, sitting writing that down right now so just remember how to shoot like a navy seal and if you type that in anywhere it will lead you to my home uh online and uh you can i have a blog that i have there Uh, i have a my membership site you'll see links to there my youtube channel has like 200 free videos or something like that Uh, i've got seventy thousand. Uh, subscribers there so that's doing well my newest thing is i have an app for the ios and android it's called seal training s-e-a-l training so if you go to the wherever you get your apps from uh, and type that in um it's a really cool app um I'm, i've just i actually haven't released it uh like a full release yet like i've I think this might be the first time I'm telling people about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got an exclusive here. Wow. Um, yeah. So I've been doing like beta testing with my members, giving them access to it and like, you know, how can this work the best? But um, so what it is, it, it's essentially, it's got some information, you know, some training for me, but the big part is tracking your training. So there's three areas to track your training and it's, um, they're called um, my, uh, my skills, myself, and my team. So my skills are things like practicing dry fire training, like whatever you know, skill tool that you want to get better at, it's going to be able to track your training in that. And then myself is like meditation, exercise, um, diet, because um, like, I'm very much in, into that stuff. Um, I bet we could have a whole show just on diet and exercise. Well, um, you know what, Chris? I got down here, current training, fitness, martial arts, skills, diet. And we, we didn't even get a chance to get through that. I told you, I said, if we get through uh, the if, list if today. We started, if you would have asked anything <laughs> on that, we would have spent the whole time on that. Well, we're, we're, we're going to do that. Not right now, but uh, I, I, I would love to do that. Yeah. So anyway, so this app, it, you, you track all your stuff in there and you get like points for, for doing action, like for practicing. And it keeps track of it. And there's like a leaders board on there. And then I'm getting ready to um, start working with companies. You know, maybe like uh, if I could find a good uh, knife company to partner with. (laughs) If somebody were to practice, you know, some skill uh, for uh, 30 days straight, they get a a discount code for for a knife. You know, like you win, Hmm. you win, you know, different prizes or you can have competitions on there. Uh, stuff like that, like photo competition, um, you know, mm-hmm. who can take the best photo of an Emerson knife and then you can win. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> we need to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I can even, uh, it's pretty cool because I can actually, um, well, we'll talk about it offline, but I can sell channels mm-hmm. like like blog channels to, you know, like, like to you. I could sell you a, a channel, you could post whatever you, you want on there. Um, and the, the, the very, the coolest thing, and I don't want to go in too much on it, but I'm just, 
getting this started up. So I'm, this is mm-hmm. like my big focus lately. So I just got the stats back on um, how active my users are. So it's, go, it's called like MAU, monthly active users. Mm-hmm. And like my uh, activity, I only have like 700 people on it right now, but I have like, a, a, I don't even know how many more thousands times more uh, activity oh, yeah. than I do than like Facebook does mm-hmm. or you know Instagram or all these things. So like people who are on my app are like using it like every single day. Like, wow. Like almost everybody that's uh, has the app uses it at least three times a day, Dang. you know? So, bring, yeah. So bringing in companies that could advertise like mm-hmm. things that are going to help, um, you know, help these people out, like things they're interested in, bring them in and go, Hey, you're going to get viewed, you know, three times a day by everybody on this app. Like that's mm-hmm. something that other marketing channels definitely can't do. So wow. that's interesting too. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been a really interesting conversation, Chris, and uh, it has been really fun. appreciate it. Uh, Danny, you got any questions? Or No, I'm good for now. Okay. Well, Chris... Yeah, uh, a lot of times people ask me how I got to be so good looking, but that... that one... <laughs> <laughs> That's another channel. <laughs> wait, 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 why are you laughing so hard? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> brother. <laughs> <laughs> I say the same thing. <laughs> That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> hey, listen, Chris, thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to be in touch. I'll tell you what, uh, uh, today's my, my uh, middle daughter's birthday. So we are going to, right after we sign off, we're going to go over and, and have some cake. So uh, I got a lot of things to digest uh, besides just the food today. Because, man, you've planted some real seeds uh, that I want to uh, talk about and think about uh, until we meet again so uh, sounds good brother excellent chris thank you thank you for everything you've done uh and uh continue to do uh because really uh when you get a chance to do things that uh, help people survive and stay alive and protect themselves and empower themselves uh you know we're in a world where we see people like that but overall there's not a lot of people on the planet that get the privilege to do the things like like you've talked about today so uh you can be very very proud of that and it's an honor to know you and and uh pleasure talking to you man thanks, well, thanks for having me on brother oh thank you very much man thank you chris all right chris we will right, see, see you, you. bye well ladies and gentlemen uh you know it, it's funny I, I think you can maybe hear in the background i hope i Maybe some of it even came through uh, when when we were talking to Chris here. Uh, this is at my shop, and uh, there is the sound of the factory in the background. So again, that's not a mistake, and that's not anything that we're we're going to worry about on our end, Danny. Because uh, you know that's it is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah, and uh, we're not a podcast uh, company. We're a knife company, and uh, so we we <laughs> we still have to make sure that runs. Uh, um, all the time that it can so if you hear any stuff in the background during some of our podcasts that's that's normal everyday stuff the only thing we do generally is uh unplug our phones just so that they're not ringing in uh, into our offices because we're on the phone system and they ring in all the different uh, offices so but i might forget to unplug it sometimes too so if that phone rings uh again that's that's because we're at the we're at the factory so anyway uh that was a that was a heck of a podcast today danny yeah there, there, was, there was one question i forgot to, i didn't ask him but the question is when can we have you on again because <laughs> uh i just enjoyed enjoyed every minute of it oh that's good because i did too and you know it, it's funny because i i'm i hope that you people uh, out there that are listening to this are learning um uh, as much as I am, because uh, uh, I learned something every time I talk to any of our guests, and it's it's been a uh, <laughs> you can hear in our background <laughs> <laughs> building something back there. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I learned quite a bit today, and I think there'll be quite a bit more to learn if we have Chris on again. So that was cool. a lot of fun. So anyway, uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, 
how can you support the podcast? Uh, you can do that by subscribing, by buying uh, any of the stuff on our podcast website at ErnestEmersonPodcast.com. Uh, you can leave us a review on iTunes uh, or comments over on Facebook. Uh, you can, excuse me, on, uh, on uh, YouTube. Uh, like us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, I'm going st- to... I'm going to try and get out there and, and start leaving some uh, messages on on Twitter. Uh, uh, oh, cool. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's a hammer. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, you can find it, the Emerson Podcast on Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, uh, you can subscribe on YouTube and just search the uh, the Ernest Emerson podcast. And as always, you can always find all of the products and everything else we offer on our site, ErnestEmersonPodcast.com. And, you know, Chris Chris was one of the guys that uh, who was out there on the front lines for quite a while. I didn't know he was in the, on the teams and, and in the Navy for, for quite that long. He's, he's – he – joined in the 80s so you know that goes back a little ways he seems a lot younger than uh yeah than than that uh but anyway um i want to thank uh all of our sponsors the order of the black shamrock and uh you can find out about them at uh, order of the black shamrock.com and of course hoist gracie jiu-jitsu south bay uh they can be found at hoist gracie south bay.com uh, we got some fun stuff coming up with Hoyce uh, and uh, and his stuff uh, this year. I'm going to be doing a class actually at uh, uh, his black belt testing uh, ceremonies that they're going to have later in this year. So, oh neat, that, yeah, that'll that'll be a big deal. I'm looking, we really looking forward to that. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I need to thank, uh, and we all need to thank uh, all of the men and women on the front lines, wherever that may be, and uh, who. Those people are are the warriors and protectors for all of the rest of us. May God bless and protect our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coasties, and all those who wear the badge or are the first responders. Without your bravery and sacrifice, we would, with certainty, excuse me, without your bravery and sacrifice, we would, with certainty, have not become the greatest nation in the history of mankind. And none of us could sleep soundly in our beds at night. Thank you all, and thank you for listening. Signing out.